Bjorn is on a relentless campaign for smart environmental decisions. He's been named one of the 50 people who could save the planet by the UK's Guardian newspaper and one of the most 75 most influential people by TAM magazine. The results of his consultations with some of the world's leading economists suggest a different approach to tackling climate change, which means focusing on innovative low-carbon technologies rather than the traditional focus on taxes and caps. Listen to that, Prime Minister and Leader of the Opposition. The fundamental point I'd like to make just before I get started is to remember what it is that we're actually trying to do. We're trying to make a better world. So let's remember, we've got to ask all the time, not just how do we cut carbon emissions, but how do we actually make a better world? I find a lot of what we talk about in the global warming conversation is more about stuff that's fashionable rather than stuff that's actually rational. We talk about stuff that makes us feel good rather than things that'll actually do good. So let's make sure that when we talk about how we're going to cut carbon emissions, how we're going to fix global warming, that it actually has a huge impact and not just a, 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 a symbolic impact. We also need to remove our myths because fundamentally we have lots of myths. That's true in all different areas, but certainly also in the environmental area. And I think they make it harder for us to find the smart solutions. Ultimately, if we're scared witless and it's not true, we're unlikely to make good policy judgments. And the last point I just want to make is that we really need to make sure we spend our money in the best possible way. If we over worry and overspend in some areas, it means inevitably that we end up underspending in other areas. So really, let me just get going and talk about how we're going to deal with global warming. Obviously, lots of people are involved in this conversation. Uh, Al Gore is one of them. Uh, Al Gore and I gave a presentation to, uh, to Congress. And I think lots of really good and well-meaning people are involved in talking about how do we fix global warming. However, I think there's a fundamental problem the way that we have tried to do so. I'll get back to that. And I think we need a new and smarter way forward. Before I get into that, though, I'd like to just talk about a few other points. And simply, if you'll allow me, I'd like to just make four simple points in trying to get us to talk about how do we smartly tackle global warming. The first point is global warming is real. It's man-made. It is an important problem. It is something we need to tackle. So let's get beyond the idea of saying, oh, it's just a, a, a left-wing conspiracy to raise taxes. No, it's not. Global warming is real. It's a problem we need to uh, face up to. I think we should thank Al Gore and many other well-meaning people for having put it on the agenda. This is something we need to tackle. I would argue the best information that we get on global warming, although it's by no means perfect, comes from the UN Climate Panel, the so-called IPCC. To give you a sense of proportion, uh, the UN estimate that the likely temperature rise that we're going to see by the end of the century is around 2.6 degrees centigrade, somewhere between 1.6 and 3.8 from what it is today. That doesn't sound like a huge amount, but because it's a global uh, average, it's actually significant temperature increase. That will both have positives and negative impacts. Overall, it'll have more negative impacts, which is why global warming is a problem. And if you ask the economists to try to model this, say, overall, what's the impact in total of all the global warming damage and benefits, but predominantly damages, the estimate is that global warming will cost us about $15 trillion. Now, before the financial crisis, this used to be a very big number, but it's still a pretty big number, and it ought to make us you know, sit up straight and think about, all right, how are we going to tackle this? This is a problem that's significant. We need to find a smart way. However, you should also recognize if we take the UN climate panel estimate of what's the total cost of, or, or sorry, the impact, or no, the Im the income of the 21st century, that's about $3,000 trillion. So we're talking about half a percentage point of the 21st century. And I think that's important to put it, global warming into context. It is not 0% damage. But it's not 100% damage either, as you sometimes seem to get the, impact, uh, the, the sense of when you, when you read some of the media coverage. Global warming is a problem. It's not zero, but it's not the end of the world either. And that means we can stop having this very favorite discussion between people saying, oh, it's not a problem at all, it's the end of the world. No, it's a problem, and it's a problem we need to fix smartly. And that's really what I would like to talk to you about. I'd like to propose a middle-of-the-road argument, if you will, not the deniers, but not the alarmist either, trying to find smart ways to fix global warming like we fix many other problems in the world. Before I'll get there, so yes, global warming is real, it's man-made, it is an important problem. I think there's a significant stumbling block, and that is that it's often dramatically exaggerated and one-sidedly presented, which makes it very hard for us to have a good conversation on global warming. Fundamentally, 
scare tactics make for bad public judgment. Uh, again, I'm, I'm going to pick on Al Gore, not because he's uh, be by any means the only one who said it, but I think he's been the most vocal preponderant, uh, proponent for this. He calls global warming a planetary emergency. He talks about how we just have 10 years to avert a major catastrophe that could send our entire planet into a tailspin of epic destruction involving extreme weather, floods, droughts, epidemics, killer heat waves beyond anything we've ever experienced. That certainly sounds like something you want to avoid. Uh, and, and I think you know, in, in many ways, this is the kind of message that we get from virtually all media all of the time. So let's try and take a look at this. I'd love to go into more detail. Uh, I usually uh, just go through uh, four of these issues, just heat death, sea level rise, hurricanes, malaria. Uh, these are some of the things that Al Gore talked about. Uh, given that we just have very short time, let me just focus on one, namely on heat deaths to get a sense of what is the argument that we hear and to what extent does it hold up and of course to what extent does it actually inspire good public policy. We can talk about some of these other issues in the Q&A later on. So if we're talking about killer heat waves, which of course is also an issue here in Australia, what's the up and down on that? Are we going to see more heat deaths? Yes, absolutely. That's really quite simple. If temperatures rise, we're going to see more heat waves and hence we're going to see more people dying from heat. We need to be honest about that. We have some of the best estimates for Europe, uh, uh, about 50 researchers across the US, uh, sorry, across Europe uh, did a study of all the cold and heat deaths that we were likely to see because of global warming. And they actually estimate in the UK by mid-century because of global warming, we're estimating to see about 2,000 more people die every year because of global warming. So that's definitely something we need to be honest about and be forthcoming about and say, this is a problem. This is definitely a problem caused by global warming. Now, there's two problems I have with this argument. We hear this part, the 2,000 figure, a lot. But there's another thing we don't hear, and we don't hear very much about, so how should we actually tackle it? One part is, it's only part of the argument that as temperatures rise, we're going to see more heat waves and hence more heat deaths. Absolutely true. But of course, as temperatures rise, we're also going to see fewer cold waves and hence fewer people dying from cold. Shouldn't that count in there as well? Of course, if this is a trivial number, maybe it wouldn't matter, but it's not. The very same studies that show that we're going to see about 2,000 more people die in Britain every year because of global warming also indicate that we're going to see fewer people die from cold in Britain. And not just a trivial number but they actually indicate that we're going to see about 20,000 fewer cold deaths. So being told we're going to see 2,000 more people die from heat, which is absolutely true, but not being told the, if you will, inconvenient truth of 20,000 fewer people being killed by cold, I don't think we're being very well informed. Now, this does not mean that I'm saying, hey, maybe we should have more global warming. That's not the point that I'm trying to make here, because overall there will both be positive and negatives. There are more negatives than positives. But I'm simply pointing out that fundamentally we're not being well informed if we're only hearing one side of the argument. We're essentially being scared, witless, and making poor policy judgments. Of course, you, you might be forgiven to think, hey, maybe Bjorn is just showing us for the UK because it gives the right result. Maybe he's just showing it because he comes from Denmark. Uh, but actually, it turns out that this is also true if you look at the only period published study that looks at all the regions indicate that this is true for virtually all regions and certainly globally we're estimating about 400,000 more heat deaths by mid-century and about 1.8 million fewer cold deaths. Now the important point here is then to say we need to hear the whole picture but much more we need to ask are there other and smarter ways to tackle these problems and the simple answer is yes. If we want to help future generations to not die from heat deaths, why on earth would we start cutting carbon emissions first? Even if we did, and even if we accept all the uh, correlations here, we would essentially say, yeah, temperatures are going to keep rising in, this, uh, in, the, in the latter part of the century, but not by quite so much. So more and more people are going to die from heat waves, but slightly fewer more towards the end of the century. Is that really the best we can do? And the answer is no. We can do much, much more good. If you look, for instance, in, Europe, uh, in the US, virtually no one dies from heat deaths anymore. Why? Because of air conditioning. If we care about people dying from heat waves, there's a very simple solution. Give people air conditioning. Now, that makes a lot of people feel uncomfortable because obviously that would increase emissions. And that's true. But then we should stop talking about this as a way of helping people effectively. But there's another and smarter and cheaper and more environmentally correct way of helping people, namely the fact that the vast majority of people are going to be living in cities by the end of the century. That's important because cities are much hotter than their surrounding countrysides uh, because there's no water, 
no trees, and lots and lots of black surfaces like asphalt. We're estimating uh, Tokyo holds a world record. Tokyo in August is about 12 and a half degrees warmer than its surrounding countryside. So these are huge figures. We could do something about that very, very simply. If the problem is that we have little water and little greenery, why don't we add some water and greenery back in there? We know for London, we have these simulations for New York, Los Angeles, many other places. For London, if we added more greenery and water, besides the fact that London would become prettier at very low cost, we would actually be able to reduce heat wave temperatures of about eight degrees, much, much more than what global warming could ever do. And of course, if the problem is black surfaces, why don't we paint some of these black surfaces in lighter colors or uh, 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 lighter colors of the rooftops. If we did that, a quarter of the, uh, London's rooftops, we could actually reduce heat wave temperatures about 10 degrees centigrade. So my point here is really twofold. It's to say we're being told a partial truth. Yes, more people are going to die from heat, but we're being failed to tell another part of the truth that certainly mitigates that argument. And also we're being told cut carbon emissions is the only solution to this. No. If you want to help people from not dying from heat, there are many more and much, much more effective ways to do so by simply giving air conditioning or making cooler cities. That does not mean we shouldn't fix global warming, but we should start saying if we care about individual impacts, there are much smarter ways we can deal with those. As I've outlined with heat waves, and that's true for malaria, for uh, sea level rise, and for hurricanes as well, I'd love to get into that in, in question time. So my real point is, yes, global warming is real. It's man-made. It is an important problem. But the way we're being told about it makes it very unlikely we're actually going to help the people that we seem to care about, like the people who die from heat waves, effectively when they're much smarter solutions. And we don't fix global warming very well. So that's my third point. We have a policy that's essentially failed for the last 20 years, namely the idea that we're going to propose large carbon cuts which then don't happen, or to the extent they happen, they're incredibly costly and do very little good. This has been going on for the last 20 years. Kyoto, the only process that's actually been implemented, uh, if you look at the average of all the macroeconomic models, indicate that the cost of a successful Kyoto protocol would have been about $180 billion per year. Yet the net effect would have been, and this is if you run the, uh, the global models, would have been an immeasurable impact on temperature by the end of the century. Of course, uh, since we virtually didn't do any of it, we've got an even smaller immeasurable impact. Uh, so fundamentally, we have been spending 10 years worth of the world's time, and a lot of its money, to do no good 100 years from now. How, how smart is that? And unfortunately, it seems like the solution is just, well, then we've got to do more of this kind of solution. Well, usually, you know, if one step in a direction is the wrong step, there's the wrong direction, it's not a good idea to take more steps in that direction. Yet that's what the EU has been proposing. We're proposing to cut 20% below 1990 levels by 2020. The average cost from the economic models indicate a cost of every year of about $250 billion. If we do this all the way through the 21st century, so 80 years, $20 trillion, we will have reduced global temperatures by about 1 20th of 1 degree centigrade by the end of the century. We won't be able to measure the difference, despite having spent $20 trillion. Again, my argument is that's not a smart way to move forward. Actually, if you ask economists, they show that for every time you spend a dollar on these sorts of proposals, and remember, this is if you spend them smartly, you will avoid a couple of cents of climate damage, about three cents of climate damage. That's a poor way of spending your money. And of course, the two degrees centigrade limit that a lot of leaders have signed up to because it sounds nice. Even if you did it the most effective way, and this is the average of all the macroeconomic models that actually say it's possible. These are all the optimistic ones, but half of them say we can't even get there. But if you assume that you can get there, the average cost is estimated by the end of the century to be about $40,000 billion a year. That's about 13% of global GDP. Of course we're not going to sign up to that. And for every dollar spent, we will avoid less than two cents of climate damage. Again, an incredibly poor investment. And of course, remember, this requires that all politicians do all the smart things across the century and across continents every time. Um, perhaps a slightly optimistic assumption, as, as was also mentioned earlier on. So fundamentally, the current approach is not working. We need one that's smarter. And that's really what I'd like to stop uh, my conversation about because I've almost used up my 15 minutes. Before I do so, though, let me just give you one sort of illustration or metaphor, if you will, because I think in many ways it's a very helpful way to think about this whole issue. It's the idea of the polar bears. 
Polar bears in many ways encapsulate global warming. If you see a picture of polar bears, you immediately think about global warming. Polar bears do look very cute, of course, unless you're really close to them. Uh, but the real point is to recognize two things. Polar bears, yes, they are in a situation where they'll be less well off because of uh, diminishing and eventually disappearing summer Arctic ice. They will have a problem. There is a real problem. But I think there are two other issues that most people and probably most people in this room don't know. One is that polar bears are certainly not in any way threatened immediately. Actually, polar bear populations globally have probably quadrupled over the last 50 years. So polar bears are fine right now, but they do have a problem in the future. So most people say, well, we got to do something about it. The honest answer is cut carbon emissions. Well, how come nobody ever tells you how much it's going to help polar bears if you cut carbon emissions? I think I know why, uh, but let's just take a look at it. If we run the models, if we, for instance, everyone implemented the Kyoto Protocol, remember, this is 20 times more than what the world actually managed to do, and do it all the way through the 21st century. If we managed to do that, how much would that help polar bears? Well, the answer turns out to be it would help about one polar bear each year. Now, I like polar bears, and I would like to save a polar bear, maybe even at a couple of hundred billion dollars, but it strikes me as bizarre that we don't talk about the fact that every year we shoot polar bears. And not just a few. Every year, the world shoots somewhere between 300 and 500 polar bears. And I don't know about you, but if we want to help polar bears. Why don't we stop shooting 300 polar bears first? <laughs> Apart from the fact there would be a couple hundred billion dollars cheaper, it would also be better for 299 polar bears. <laughs> and that's the real point. We got to get out of our mind that the only solution to every problem in the world is to cut carbon emissions. This does not mean that we don't have to cut carbon emissions in the long run. We do, but we have to start thinking about are there other and smarter ways forward? And help, uh, thankfully, there is. I helped organize something called the Copenhagen Consensus for Climate, where we brought together 28 of the world's top climate economists, three Nobel laureates, to look across all the different areas of where you can cut carbon emissions or do good for climate, and essentially assess where do you spend your money and get the most climate bang for your buck. What they essentially said was the current approaches, the Kyoto style approaches are some of the worst ways that we can spend our money. Every time you spend it all, you do a couple of cents worth of good. You avoid a couple of cents of climate damage. But there was one that stood out, one solution that's much, much better than the others. So the long-term solution really is about investing dramatically more in research and development into green energy. And that's what fundamentally, if we spend about 0.2% of GDP in research, development, demonstration, non-carbon em emitting energy technologies, this would be about $100 billion in total for the globe, it'd be twice as much, sorry, it'd be half the cost of Kyoto, but it'd be about 50 times more than what the world spends right now. It'd be about $1.6 billion for Australia, so definitely something that would be doable. The trick here is to say this would enable us to find cost-effective green technologies in the long run. I don't think we know what that technology is right now, so we should be focusing on a very broad range of different technologies. But the fundamental point is to recognize right now the policy is all about making fossil fuels so expensive nobody wants it. But of course we're never going to succeed with that. It's economically a stupid idea, but it's also politically impossible as we're seeing around the world. And for a very simple reason. We don't burn fossil fuels to annoy Al Gore. We burn fossil fuels because it basically powers everything we like about modern civilization. So telling people, could you please not do that? Telling people, could you please not lift out a couple hundred million people in China uh, uh, in, in a decade with fossil fuels is not going to win very many converts. Instead, we need to recognize the only way we're going to get people to stop emitting CO2 is not by saying, could you do with less, but finding other energy sources that will do all the great things that we like, but without emitting the CO2. Right now, solar panels and all the other uh, uh, green uh, uh, energy sources are much more expensive than fossil fuels. That's why this is a hard problem. But if we could innovate the price of, say, solar panels down below fossil fuel, we'd have won. Everyone would switch. Also the Chinese and the Indians. So the real point here is instead of trying to make fossil fuels so expensive nobody wants them, innovate green energy to be so cheap everyone wants it. The beautiful thing is it turns out that this would, in the medium term, solve global warming. And the amazing thing is the economist shows that for every dollar spent, you would avoid about $11 of climate damage. 
That's 500 times smarter than the current policy. And that means we can spend less and end up doing much more good for climate. And that, I think, is a political winner. So my real point here is, and I only got through three, but that's okay. My real point is global warming is real. It's often vastly exaggerated, which leads to bad judgments, which is what we've seen over the last 20 years. But there is a smart way forward. Let's make sure we spend that and spend the money on research and development to get those innovative, innovative uh, solutions. They'll actually power the rest of the 21st century. Thank you.